Okay. The political convention was in chaos. Each delegation wanted something different. Some favored states' rights. Others wanted a stronger central government. Larger states wanted greater representation and smaller states wanted to be equal. Debate dragged on and on. Finally, com the committee chairman admitted the situation was hopeless. After weeks of fruitless effort, the eldest delegate rose and addressed the chairman and he said, the small progress we have made after four or five weeks is melancholy, melancholy proof of the imperfections of human understanding. I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs the affairs of men. Citing the Bible, he added, and if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring, concurring aid, we shall succeed in political building no better than the builders of Babel. The speaker was Benjamin Franklin. It's ironic that Ben Franklin, who for the most part of his life was not considered devout, turned to the scriptures in a time of crisis. At 81 years of age, using the Bible for his examples, Benjamin Franklin brought a clear vision to the convention that eventually brought the delegates together and a great document was produced, the Constitution of the United States of America. I have found that in times of crisis, Yahweh's word has been there for me faithfully holding forth hope and encouragement. I have found that in times when I lacked wisdom, Yahweh's word answered my questions and gave me direction. I have found that in times when I am not sure what is right, Yahweh's word helps me discern the truth. Benjamin Franklin turned to Yahweh's word in a time of American crisis and in so doing, he found help and direction. Where do you turn in times of trouble? Where do you turn for encouragement? What is your source of truth? My message today is that Yahweh has given us his word. We call it the Bible. So let's turn to it and find what we need for life. In times of crisis, Yahweh's word faithfully holds forth hope and encouragement. There's a man by the name of John Jay. He was a delegate at the First Continental Congress. And at a very young age, Mr. Jay was one of the smartest and most respected lawyers in the colonies. You may have never heard of John Jay before. But in the early history of the U.S. government, Jay was responsible for single-handedly averting a war with England through his diplomacy. It seemed that everything Jay touched turned to success. Then in May of 1802, after 28 years of marriage, his wife Sarah became very ill. As her condition became more serious, John and their children gathered at her bedside. And when death came, the famous and powerful father felt weak and defeated. With his children by his side, he turned to the Bible for strength and began reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me, as of one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of Yahweh. But by the grace of Yahweh I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of Yahweh which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preached and so we believed. Now if Messiah be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Messiah not risen? And if Messiah be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of Yahweh, because we have testified of Yahweh that he raised up Messiah, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Messiah raised. And if Messiah be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Messiah are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Messiah, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Messiah risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, afterwards they that are Messiahs at his coming, then comes the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to Yahweh, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him that Yahweh may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not, not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Messiah Yeshua our Master. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me, if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness, and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of Yahweh. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? From what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. 
it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But Yahweh gives it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There is also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from the other star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the master from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of, a, a kingdom of Yahweh. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to Yahweh, which gives us the victory through our master Yeshua Messiah. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the master, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the master. Now that I just read you concluded when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? When he closed the Bible with tears in his eye, he spoke to his children and assured them that Yahweh's word of the promised reunion they would all someday have with the Sarah. In times of crisis, Yahweh's word is the only hope that can bring true peace to our souls. Yahweh's word has the answer if you are discouraged. John 14 verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. How about worried? In 1 Peter 5, 7, Cast in all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And how about uh, lonely? In John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. In Psalms 46, verse 1, Yahweh is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Depressed. Psalm 34, 17. The righteous cry and Yahweh hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Confused. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For Yahweh is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. 
Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eyes. The story about a young Christian family moved into town and rented the only house that was available to them. The house was in the uh, ruin, run-down section of the town, and the closest neighbor lived in a terrible, poverty-stricken condition. In an effort to love their neighbor, the couple went over to the, their neighbor's house, and they were invited inside to discover the conditions were much worse than they first expected. And as they were leaving the home, the husband noticed a dust-covered Bible under a rickety table in that house. And as he left, he said, there's a treasure in this house, which if discovered and believed, would make you all rich. Well, the family began to search the house. They wondered, could it be a jewel or a pot of gold? After searching and searching, they found nothing. Not long after that, the mother picked up the old Bible and began to look through it. As it happened, on the inside cover of the Bible was written these words, Thy testimonies are better to me than thousands of gold and silver. Psalms 119, verse 72. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. She thought to herself, Is this the treasure our neighbor spoke of? She and the other members of the family began to read the Bible. And a change took place in their hearts that were formed, filled with, formerly filled with sin and, and uh, pain and discouragement. The next time the neighbors came for a visit, to their surprise, they found a completely changed family. They said, we found the treasure and we received it, and we received the Savior. The Bible is the power that changes lives. And when you are in a crisis, it is the power that will strengthen and encourage you. The second thing, I've found that in times when I lacked wisdom, Yahweh's word answers my questions and gives me direction. The word of Yahweh has the answers for me. The word of Yahweh has the answers for everyone living throughout the world. The Bible is universal in its appeal because it isn't just a book. It is Yahweh's living word. Hebrews 4 verse 12, for the word of Yahweh is quick and powerful and sharper than two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereto I sent it. It was applicable in the first century and the 1700s and the 1900s and the 2000s, and it will be in the future. Not because it is well written, but because it is alive. The story about an American missionary was traveling across Korea. And he was traveling by train and at a busy st station, an old man boarded and sat across from him and the man was Korean. And he addressed the American in his native tongue. Why wouldn't he? he that's where he's home. The missionary responded in the only Korean phrase that he knew, which was, I don't understand. A few minutes later, the Korean tried again, but the missionary could only say, I don't understand. The Korean then tried a third question, only this time the American recognized a familiar word, Yesu, which means Yeshua. The American pointed to himself and said, Yeshua. The old man did the same thing with a smile and delight on his face. 
The Korean then unwrapped the bundle he was carrying, and it was a large Korean Bible. He turned to a page and pointed to the place that he wanted the American to read. Remembering that the Oriental Bible was written from back to front, the clergy, clergyman took his own Bible and he counted the number of books and chapters from the back to the place where the old man had pointed to. The old man had pointed to Mark 3, verse 35. Whoever does the will of Yahweh is my brother. The American searched for a suitable reply and he counted out and pointed it in the Korean Bible. It was Psalms 133, verse 1. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. The Korean man read it and smiled in agreement. And for the rest of that journey, these two men, ages apart in culture, were brought together in a remarkable friendship as they pointed first to one verse and then to another. Their separate Bibles had a common language of the Spirit. The word of Yahweh is an universal appeal and it can direct you as it has directed me. It directs us in our job. It directs us in our finances. It directs us in our character. It directs us in our lifestyle. It will direct you in your relationships. And it directs us to Yeshua, the Son of Yahweh. James 1 verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of Yahweh, that gives to all men liberally, and unbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Last, I've formed, I've found that when I was not certain what was right, Yahweh's word helped me both understand and do what is right. The truth of the word of Yahweh doesn't stand in my life as a rule book of do's and don'ts. The Bible never says, and you shall know the rules and by them you shall be bound. It says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. By allowing Yahweh's word to guide me into truth, it allows me to be free. The world is full of delusion and false ideas, all trying to bring us under bondage. But Yahweh's word brings real freedom. I've told this story before, and we'll use this as close it off. There's a story about a uh, USC uh, professor of philosophy, and he was a deeply committed atheist. His primary goal for one required class was spent the entire semester attempting to prove that Yahweh did not exist. His students was always afraid to argue with him because of his impeccable logic. For 20 years, he had taught the class and no one had ever had the courage to go against him. No one would go against him because he had a reputation and at the end of every semester on the last day of class he would say to his class of 300 or so students, if there's anyone here who still believes in Jesus, stand up. In 20 years, no one has ever stood up. They knew what he was going to do next. He would say, because anyone who, believes, who does believe in God is a fool. If God existed, he could stop this piece of chalk from hitting the ground and breaking. Such a simple task to prove that he is God, and yet he can't do it. And every year, he would drop the chalk onto the tile floor in the classroom, and it would chatter into hundreds of pieces. All the students would do nothing but stop and stare. <clears throat> Most of the students were convinced that God couldn't exist. By the way, there's an article I've read that, that said that 90% of high school students that enter into college become atheists. Mm -hmm. They lose their faith. 90%. 
Certainly a number of Christians had slipped through, but for 20 years they had been too afraid to stand up. A few years ago there was a freshman who happened to get enrolled into that class, and he was a Christian, and he had heard the stories of the professor. And for three months the, that semester he read the Bible and he prayed that he would have the courage to stand up no matter what the professor said or no matter what the class thought. Finally, the day came and the professor said, if there's anyone who still believes in God, stand up. The professor in the class of 300 or so looked at him, shocked as he stood up. You fool, if God existed, he could keep this piece of chalk from breaking when it hits the ground. And he proceeds to drop the chalk. But as he did, it slipped out of his fingers, off his shirt cuffs, onto the pleats of his pants, down his leg and off his shoe and as it hit the ground it simply rolled away unbroken. The professor's jaw dropped as he stared at the chalk. He looked up at the young man and then ran out of the lecture hall. Of course he's embarrassed. The young man who had stood up proceeded to walk to the front of the room and shared his faith in Jesus for the next half hour. 300 or so students stayed and listened as he told of God's love for them and his power through Yeshua Messiah. How was Yahweh's word impacted your life? Do you turn to it in times of trouble and encouragement? Do you turn to it when you need direction? Has it become your source of truth? Or is it down the line of your priority list of things to do, if at all? Is it just a fairy tale book to you? I've been told that by my own family. Some of my family, I even wonder. They go to church, but I don't even think they opened up the Bible ever. They don't want to see the truth. People do not want to accept the truth. Thy word is truth. And where are you going to find the word? In the Bible. Yahweh's word contains the things we need to make our life fulfilling. Let us commit to turning to its pages for our lives. Yeah, we bless.